hit the subscribe button or visit us at auau.auanet.org. Okay, we want to welcome everybody to our webinar this evening. We're about to get started. Uh, my name is uh, Seth Cohen. We're with the American Neurologic Association. This is a presentation by the Medical Student Education Committee uh, entitled Optimizing Medical Student Exposure and an Interaction with Urology Remotely. Next slide, please. So as I said, my name is Seth Cohen. I'll be moderating. You're going to see me for about another two to three minutes here, and then I'm going to be off the webcam, uh, and you're going to see our six panelists um, I'm over in Southern California at City of Hope, and uh, I've been a part of the Medical Student Education Committee for a while now. We're excited to bring this information to you. Next slide, please. We have a uh, fantastic group of panelists here. These are all superb people, and we're very fortunate to have them, um, all with membership in the Society of Academic Urology, and we appreciate their presence. Um, Dr. Badalato from Columbia, Dr. Green from University of Virginia, Dr. Kreshover from Hofstra Northwell, Dr. Mirza from the University of Kansas, Dr. Ray Blatt from Kaiser Los Angeles, and Dr. Rich Stone from Lenox Hill Hospital. Um, every one of them has a leadership role when it comes to uh, urology match and engaging with medical students during the application process. And we're, uh, we're, we, are, we look forward to their invaluable input for you. Next slide, please. So very briefly, the learning objectives, and this was on uh, some of the information you already received. We want to discuss options to facilitate exposure and interaction with urology training programs. We want to describe paths to develop familiarity with urology training programs from afar. We also want to outline resources available to facilitate medical student education in urology. This is meant to be a jumping off point from the webinars that were previously held by the Society of academic urology. Our real goal here is to answer your questions. And all of the questions you're going to see tonight were submitted by you, the medical students. And that's really our whole point of being here. Next slide, please. As an FYI, we'd love to have more questions. And so you'll notice on the GoToMeeting uh, um, portal there, there is an opportunity to type in questions and submit them. Towards the end of our discussion this evening, we're going to actually start asking questions that you are now submitting as the live webinar attendees. So we'd encourage you to think about something that we're not answering and let us know how we can do so. Next slide, please. As a very brief outline, some people had come with this question, can you just tell us about the organized entities in urology? And so, and so the Society of Academic Urologists, of which we have panelists tonight, set the rules of the match, right? They're setting the rules of the match for you, and there, there's been a couple of webinars about that. The American Neurological Association provides the infrastructure for the match, right? They provide the computer resources to actually run the numbers and run the match. In addition, we provide educational resources to medical students and to urologists in general, but that's that's part and parcel to the mission of the Medical Student Education Committee. And then there's the American Board of Urology, which really acts for the benefit of the public and really has to do more with establishing and maintaining standards for certification of urologists. In truth, this really only comes into play postgraduate training. So this is only after you've completed a residency. Next slide, please. So we're gonna get right into it now with questions to keep our time used well. I'm gonna go ahead and hide my webcam. And then Dr. Badalotta will hopefully have the opportunity to come back on. I'm going to read over the slides very briefly, and then we're going to go right to our panelists to get answers. So first, first set of questions. How much will virtual sub ice factor into a program's decision to interview an applicant? How significant is it not to do a virtual sub i Meaning in COVID-19 era, there are students out there trying to make up missed requirements for rotations. They might not have time for a virtual sub i and what should you consider when you're deciding whether or not to do a particular virtual sub eye? There's a lot to chew on here, and we're gonna go right to Dr. Richstone to give some input for these set of questions. Okay, wow, there is a lot here, and there's a lot to sink <laughs> our teeth into. We don't throw softballs, Dr. Richstone, no, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we're, all, uh, we're all super happy to be here to share some information with you, and, and we're thrilled that you're all interested in urology. You're making a great choice, urology is, is urology rocks. So, how much will virtual sub ice factor into a program's decision to interview an applicant? I personally don't think it will factor that much. Um, it, it didn't really impact our program's uh, decision that much to uh, offer interviews in the pre-COVID world. Um, you know, we inter all programs interview way more people than they have sub you know entertain for sub ice. You know, so a program might interview 30 or 40 folks, and maybe they only have three, four, five sub eyes or whatnot. It's a fraction. So I personally don't think it's that much of an issue uh, to, to gain interviews. Um, how significant is it not to do a virtual sub eye or put it the other way, how important is it to do a sub eye? 
Um, you know, it's going to be an interesting match year. I don't think any of us really know how strong a factor it's going to be. I personally think that um, it's a great opportunity to learn urology. And if you have programs that you're interested in, I think it'll only be a positive if you do a good job. And that's always been the rub about sub eyes. I mean, if you do a sub eye and you do a lousy job and you don't show up on time, well, it, it, there's the potential that it could hurt you with a program. And it's always been that way. If you do a great job and you're enthusiastic and you're prepared and you're interacting, I think it could very much help you. Uh, I personally, I'm biased because I put a lot of effort into constructing the, the schema for virtual sub eyes, but I think that you'll get a lot of uh, exposure to faculty at a given program. I think that faculty is going to appreciate your energy and enthusiasm and positive attitude to experiment with it. So I think it's going to be more of a help, not a hindrance. I'd put it that way. Is it necessary? No. If you don't do one, is it going to hurt your chances of matching? I doubt it. But if you do do one, I think it really is. I think it's more likely to be beneficial. I, I, that's my feeling. And uh, what should I consider when deciding whether to do or not to do a particular virtual sub eye? Well, I guess the word here is per, to do a particular sub eye. I guess that means like a sub eye here versus in yeah, one institution versus another, right? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, if you could find out what they're offering and how they're approaching, that that would be great. I mean, we have a common model that we're using. But programs are probably in a different how they employ it. Um, so it may be worth reaching out. I would try to reach out probably to the program director if possible and say, hey, what are you what are you planning to do for your virtual sub eye this year? And see if it sounds like they're lining up a nice program. Excellent. What do the other panelists think? Yeah, let's jump to Dr. Bottolato. What what would you take from this? Uh, what, how would you answer some of these questions here, Dr. Bottolato, for the for the webinar attendees? Hi. Thank you, Seth. Um, I agree with much, much of what Lee said, um, having also worked on the virtual sub eye curriculum. The key point there is that if you do it and you do it well, it's helpful. Um, but you want to think about as an applicant, understanding that not everyone's going to get to do a virtual sub eye. What are the situations that you thrive in? Um, this is admittedly different than a clinical sub eye. These are going to be um, a little bit more segmented in terms of your interactions with faculty and potentially with residents. And it's good to talk to your advisors to see, you know, um, if they think that this is an environment that you can really showcase your skills well in, um, because if you if you can translate your personality, your skills, and your strengths to the virtual sub, I think it can help you. But if but if you're not somebody that may do well in a virtual environment, I think that it's it's good to, you know, it can't hurt you to forgo that opportunity. It might help to get you some face time with the program, but it, it can't hurt you if you don't do it. Um, so if you do it and you do it poorly or you can't um, kind of be yourself in that environment, I would advise you not to do it at all. And really to look at the structure and the organization of the sub by the length, the requirements, um, who you're gonna be interacting with because uh, each program may run them slightly differently. And that might help with your decision-making. Excellent. Okay, Dr. Ray Blatt, what would you add to this discussion? I think you're muted. We lost you, Dr. Ray Blatt. Oh, you're back. <laughs> there you are. Yeah, I got pushed to the side. Uh, thank you, Seth. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. So um, I have... Uh, I really appreciate everything Lee and his group what they did in forming a virtual sub eye and building the infrastructure for it. So it allows people who are really interested in this form of uh, learning additional information about urology to use it. Uh, on the other hand, I feel that number of virtual sub eyes that are currently available, even if each sub eye can take a number of patients, a number of students and rotate through, does not allow everyone who wishes to do a virtual sub eye to do so. So specifically for my program and several of the programs I talked to, I think it will not, or I'm, I'm certain it will not hurt you not to do one. We, we here locally will not uh, consider virtual, not doing a sub I as a negative or a, anything to go against you during the application process. So um, 
if that's something that interests you and a particular program really is appealing to you and you want to get to know uh, folks closer, I think it's a good way to do so. If it's uh, something that really breaks into where your education is, and I would implore people to really focus on exploring on their education as a fourth year student, because you're gonna be a urologist for the rest of your life. And this is your time to learn cardiology, dermatology, MICU, uh, colorectal, vascular, all these fields that we interact with and you are paying for your medical education. So I would focus on exploring uh, and broadening my medical education at this point. You know, I think it's a really important set of questions here, so we're going to stay on it. Let's go to Dr. Green. Dr. Green, anything else you would add to this discussion? No, I think I agree with everyone. It, this may be a way for an applicant to demonstrate interest to a particular program, which I know is a, a question that a lot of people have this year, is how do, how do I catch a program's attention? So if a program offers a virtual sub-I, this might be a way to do it, but I would echo everyone else's statement. If you're going to do it, do it well. Great. Okay, really let's go to the next slide. And give it 100%. Excellent, excellent. Actually, you're prescient because if we jump to the next slide, let's see that question. We're, we're, we're waiting for the computer to, to link up. There we go. Okay. So, um, there you go. With no in person sub eyes. What are program directors and programs looking for app for an application that will make students stand out? How does an applicant become visible? What are examples or criteria most programs are considering significantly in decisions this novel year? So, Dr. Green will come back to you seeing this question what what is something a student could do to, to stand out and become visible with no in-person sub by and you're asking me again i am okay um so i think number one virtual sub eyes that's certainly a way to stand out um and i think communication you know if you i hate to say this but <laughs> in my opinion if a student is interested in my program and they sent me an email letting me know that i would appreciate that it's not a violation of the match rules before anything happens and I think it does help to distinguish you or just to try to find out a little bit more about the program you can reach out to residents or um, other people so that's a good way to stand out become visible and examples of criteria most programs are considering significantly in decisions you know I, I think this is this is going to be it's going to be program to program you know some programs are going to have specific criteria in terms of publications where you're from uh, what your scores are. Other programs don't necessarily have cutoffs or criteria like that. So I think that's going to be very different. One thing I've heard from a lot of different programs, though, is um, we want to know who is genuinely interested in our program versus people who are just mass applying. And I know there's a lot of fear about people just applying to an extraordinary number of programs they're not genuinely interested in. So any way to really show you are really interested in a particular program will get you visible and will factor in your favor. Great, thanks very much. Dr. Mirza, as a program director at, at your medical center, what would you add to this, this set of questions here as far as answers go? How, how, what, what are you gonna be looking for this year that may stand, make, make students stand out or make them visible? Or, you know, it really is unique about this year with no in-person sub eyes. Yeah, thank you, Seth. I would uh, echo most of what Dr. Green has already said. I think the way you make yourself visible is doing a virtual sub eye, attending town hall uh, meetings that are happening for various medical pro for various programs because we're registering those we're seeing who's there who's asking questions who's interested i think an email uh, from you to our program saying hey i'm interested for xyz reason um, you know you can it's very easy to tell when you cut and paste an email uh, versus one that you write genuinely because you're interested for a, a specific reason into the program um, I think those things are helpful. It's also a time to tap relationships from your mentors. Um, so if you know Dr. Green and you want to rotate uh, or match at um, uh, KU, well, then you say, hey, Dr. Green, will you call Dr. Mirza and tell him I'm interested? Um, and we all know each other really well, all the program directors and chairs. Um, it's a small network of urologists. We meet at uh, various uh, conferences we're on these uh, panels together so i think it's a good time to uh, have relationships um, that your mentors have established uh, to be put into play as far as criteria go that's no different this year than it's been any other year as dr richstone said we interview plenty of applicants who do not do sub eyes with us so in-person sub eye doesn't preclude an interview 
Um, so those criteria remain the same. That's your academic performance, your research interests and in publications, um, your extracurricular activities, your letters of recommendations. All those things are still going to be there on your application that help you stand out. Your personal statement, your dean's letter. So those criteria are the same. The in-person sub I has been taken away, but we interview about 40 applicants every year who have not done any sub I's with us. So we're not really looking until we actually look at their letters to see where they potentially may have rotated. In fact, we can't even ask you where you did your sub I. That's a violation of the match rules. We can tell because you have a letter from somewhere. So we can put two and two together, but that's never been a criteria. So I think the criteria are pretty much the same as they have been in the past. Excellent input, thank you. Dr. Kreshover, anything to add to, to this discussion here? I completely agree with what um, everyone has said previously. The only thing I potentially would add is that the uniqueness of this year is that we will be forced to look at the applications a little bit differently uh, with less reliance on letters than we had in the past. And I think it's a big opportunity for students to take more time or put potentially more interest in thought into the personal statement. Um, that's probably the area where you have a chance a little bit to stand out. You know, most people will write about, everyone knows that urology is broad and interesting and we have lots of big cases, small cases, and that makes it fun and that made all of us interested in it. But we all know that. And so, you know, using your personal statements this time, I think could be far more important than anything else. Um, because as Dr. Mirza said, everything else is really the same. We're using all the same. It's it's not, despite the fact that it's a crazy year, nothing's really that different in terms of the applications. Excellent, thanks. I wanna open it up to the panel. Does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to this set of uh, questions before we move on? Um, I agree with what everyone was saying about having a mentor reach out or someone that knows you well. Um, and I think that Eurostream, which is a program started by Michael Ernst, who is the president of the AUA um, Residence Committee, in which uh, a student is paired up with a, a resident mentor, is a great opportunity to kind of to get mentorship if you don't have it otherwise. Um, and in working with this resident, um, you know, ostensibly on topics related to urology and learning at different educational topics, you build relationships and uh, you gain kind of uh, an advisor in that capacity. So I think that's an excellent opportunity to take advantage of. Thanks for reminding us about that valuable resource. Okay, let's go to the next I'd slide. I'd only throw yes, one in please. one. I think they were outstanding comments. You got a smart panel here because they think they, they gave really good advice to you tonight. Um, I think uh, Kirsten first brought up this idea of uh, reaching out and expressing interest. I think that's a really important thing. I, I do point out, though, do not expect uh, necessarily a reply. Uh, and a lack of a reply does not mean that, oh, we don't we don't love you back. Uh, but again, in terms of match rules, I think we're going to we try not to reach out to the candidates, even if even if you reached out first. Um, but it is like some big, crazy dating game where no one gets to say they like each other. It should be like a show on Netflix, like some big crazy dating game, but no one can say they have any interest and then just see where it all falls. But <laughs> so, but anyway, so I think knowing that you really have genuine interest is I think all program directors that would help the process. Seth, I also wanted to add, uh, I'd like students to try to explore and see something good in this year. Historically, you would apply to your 40 programs, but you really didn't have a good sense where you're applying other than either your mentor or your friends told you to check off those boxes. This is the first time, and hopefully it will stay, that almost every program is putting an effort forward to let you know who we are, what we stand for on the faculty side, residency culture, uh, your cribs where people show you where they sort of sleep and eat and operate. I think this is a phenomenal year, although it feels really, really stressful. This will completely change how you choose those 30 or 40 or God forbid 70 programs you apply to. All fabulous input. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to the next slide. By the way, just as a reminder, you can submit questions too. Um, online, so so don't forget if you have something that we're not answering, don't forget to submit it. It stays in a list, so it doesn't go away, and we see it, and we'll try to come back to it. 
Okay, so this slide, our program is going to release step one ranges, a very common question we received when we asked for, when we queried for these questions from, from medical students. What advice do you have for students with lower step one scores who might otherwise have received more interview invites um, based on away rotations? And how do I judge the competitiveness of my application when deciding which programs to apply to? Let's go to Dr. Kreshover. What would you add to the, the discussion here, Dr. Kreshover? Uh, I mean, for the students with the step one scores, I, my advice would be the same as it as it was pre-COVID in that basically to reiterate what we discussed previously is that reaching out to the programs is of the utmost importance. And these are the exact students where a virtual sub I would potentially benefit you that even if you aren't having the same clinical experience, you have the opportunity to show your personality, your acumen, your ethic, Etc. to try and help get a program to know you better beyond the scores. Um, but yeah, reaching out and doing the virtual sub eyes. Got it. Dr. Mirza, what would you say to some of these questions about, n number one, what do you think about programs releasing step one ranges? Is that is that something we should be doing more often? And number two, how, how should they navigate a low step one score if they can't be with you in person? So for the first question, uh, you know, we have reviewed this question in terms of programs releasing their criteria that they may use to invite interview applicants at the level of the Society of Academic Urology. And uh, we don't have a consensus around that. And as, uh, so this was a question before the pandemic started, and we thought maybe it would be a good idea for a program to release their criteria, um, including their step one ranges. Um, and as COVID has sort of taken over the conversation, this particular question has taken a backseat. Um, and as step one, no longer in a couple of years will be even used because there will be no score to look at, it may become a moot point for further discussion you know, at a higher level. So long story short, probably not. Uh, programs are not gonna release their step one ranges to you, but that is a discoverable question. So if you're interested in a program and you're not sure, if you're a competitive applicant for that program, um, you can certainly uh, email the program director and say, hey, this is my step one score. Do I stand a chance to apply? Or just go ahead and apply and see what happens. As far as what to do with a low step one score, um, I think uh, this was already mentioned twice and we'll say it the third time, you need a mentor. First thing you need to do is get yourself a mentor. If you don't have one already, you're already behind. Um, so get yourself a mentor and ask them how you emphasize other parts of your application, which are important. Um, and the step one score is just one of them. It's a pretty important screen that a lot of programs use to look at which applicants are gonna interview and not interview. Um, so in order to make it past that screen, you need somebody on the other side to say, hey, I'm interested whether you've made that connection personally yourself or whether that mentor has emailed somebody and said, hey, I know this guy or this gal has a low step one score, but she is awesome, she's great, please look at her more carefully, read her personal statement, this is how she's thrived. Um, so I think those things are really, really important to be able to emphasize other parts of your application. Um, and in terms of judging your competitiveness of your application when deciding a program to apply to, I think you just have to use like historic gestalt and ideas that people have around programs. Um, and again, because most programs have not shared that information, um, it may be hard to get it outside of just emailing somebody. Some programs put it on their website. Um, and, you know, you, we certainly know what our averages are when it comes to step one scores and how many people we match with AOA and Gold Humanism Awards and things like that. So those are all things we're looking at, obviously. So somebody can help you with that. Um, I don't think there's like some central place where you'll be able to find that to judge the competitiveness. Ask your mentor. These are great comprehensive answers. Dr. Badalotto, anything to add to this before we move on? I, I agree with everything that's been said. Mentorship is of utmost importance. Um, I would encourage also people not just to look at um, program specific information, but look at the information within your medical school. Most deans of student affairs, they do save data on um, student you know, performance during their medical school board score, where on their rank list they ended up matching, where they ended up going. And while that might not give you 
like an aggregate set of information for a particular program, it does give you a sense of what people at your medical school, what their track record has been and how they've performed in the match. So I think that your school specific data is easily accessible and, and an important resource. Excellent. Okay, let's move on to the next slide and keep 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 the information coming. Okay. Dr. Richstone, without in-person sub eyes, how can applicants demonstrate interest in a region of the country they might not they might not have interacted with previously or otherwise? Um, well, again, I think we're seeing a theme here. Uh, uh, but you know, there are a lot of similar answers to a lot of the questions. But there are virtual sub eyes, so that's certainly one opportunity. We talked about reaching out to programs uh, either directly or through your mentors. So those are other avenues for communication. Um, other than that, I don't know if I have any other comments on this one personally. Uh, Dr. Ray Blatt, I live in New York City. I've, I've gone to Columbia with Dr. Bottolato. I was uh, I went to Brown for undergrad. How do I convince you I'm interested in Kaiser LA? Post a surfing picture on your Twitter. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, I think, uh, as we said earlier, contacting the program uh, and showing interest, explaining what attracts you on the other side of the country. Because even during pre-COVID times, when you look at the application and you look at somewhat of a geography, sometimes you wonder, what really attracts this phenomenal applicant to the West Coast? And if you see completely no ties, it, it does uh sort of raise a question why this person is applying here and then sometimes you find it in a personal statement or see during interview i think residents are also a great resource as we're talking about contacting the program and and either through the mentor or yourself now that a lot of town uh, halls uh, give you an opportunity to contact uh, residents you can maintain this relationship with the resident and uh through the residents because we all talk to our residents and we'll listen to our residents see if you can express your interest that way i know for our program we our residents make themselves available mm -hmm. after the town hall uh, email text and somewhat on the personal level and we're probably going to do it in a little formal way anybody who expresses interest can be paired up with residents for a short period of time i think that's another way other than faculty and the, directly with the program director to show interest and also if you have a story that's tied to geography let us know Excellent. Anyone have anything to add to this? Otherwise, we're going to move on. I was just going to say there's two elements to. Oh, Chris, Chris, you go ahead. My only comment was going to be is to not is to try not to focus on geography too much too. I think that like people spend a lot of time worried about where they're going to live and how. And in reality, personally, I think it's best not to to go to the place where you ultimately want to end up. There is great value in seeing a diversity of places, a diversity of, um, you know, opinions, whatever, and that only helps you in the long term in terms of um, training to see lots of different things from different areas. I would sort of argue this a little bit coming from personal experience. My geography was extremely limited for very personal reasons. and. To me, it was either this limited geography or no urology, as hard as it is and worked out for me well. But if you have a specific reason to be tied to geography, not because this town is cool to live with and it has good dining scene, but some real connection to geography, then you need to make your choices and let the programs know, but also make your own personal choices what's important. Got it. I was just gonna make a, a little brief comment, which is that there's two elements to this. There, there might be, how do you express this interest to, to get an interview, which is entirely different from once you're interviewing and how do you let people know you're for real and you kind of go the distance. And, and the answer is different for those different things. I would just remind folks when it comes to the interview part of that, like I've certainly interviewed candidates in Manhattan and the patients from SoCal and great candidate and then we're kind of in the back room scratching our heads is this person really going to come here or not you know are they really going to come here or not and there is that inherent kind of sense so don't be afraid if you really want to go somewhere when you're at an interview don't be afraid to express your feelings like you know you're at the interview i, I really like this program i, I really want to be here i'm not here just to scope it out etc and people will hear you so don't be afraid to express yourself uh when you're on an interview and make your desires known. 
Excellent. Okay, I think we're going to move on to the next question. Okay, is asking for a letter of recommendation from a virtual mentor not wise? Dr. Green, what do you think? Is it is it reasonable to get a letter from a virtual mentor or, or perhaps lean away from that? I think whether you're asking for a letter of recommendation from a virtual mentor or an in-person mentor, the key here is making sure it's someone who knows you well and is gonna write a strong letter. So if you have somebody who's virtual or in-person and they know you and they can write you a great strong letter, then definitely ask for it. You don't want to ask for a letter from someone who doesn't know you well or is going to write you a wishy-washy letter. So that's my basic advice for anything. Excellent. Dr. Badalato, anything to add to that? I, I agree. I think that as long as the letter, if the letter is strong, then it will help your application. I think that it might be wise to have a combination between you know, in-person and virtual letters, if that's what, if you're going the path of getting a virtual letter. Um, and I think that um, for the virtual letter, the letter writer will be, you know, very specific about what, you know, the strengths that they're assessing. All, all many of these are, you know, what translates from an in-person sub-I does, does carry through with virtual sub i such as clinical knowledge, preparedness, um, productivity, um, and engagement in the operating room. So these are things that, that can be assessed either in person or virtually and that somebody can make strong comments on. But you should gauge the strength of your connection rather than the modality of the connection. Um, and again, consider diversity and who you're asking so definitely the people that know you from your home institution will talk to you at your in-person performance but um, the virtual sub i can augment some of those observations Great, i also good. want to add i think this year we know that letters are more difficult come around and if in the past letters not from urologists would be almost not considered sort of as heavily as letters from urologists. This year, we will be very careful and considerate of letters that come from people who know you well, even if they're not from the urology community. Interesting point. Uh, going back to the point about geographic variation and showing interest outside of your geographic range, if you, for instance, if you're, you're mostly Northeast based, but you did a virtual sub I, in, on the West Coast, that, that might be a helpful letter to include um, because it will demonstrate geographic interest. Right. And it's important to note that only two letters are required this year, although you can have a maximum of four. Very good. Anything, anyone else have anything to add? Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, next slide. Some programs have emphasized including step two scores in their application with step two dates being canceled and rescheduled at varying times, will programs move away from the use of step two altogether? Dr. Mirza, what do you think of step two in this application cycle? Yeah, I think uh, we can only evaluate um, what is available to us. Uh, so if you don't have a step two score and you weren't able to take step two uh, for the reasons uh, that are obvious, then that's okay. It's not gonna get looked at. And because it's missing, we're not going to be thinking why you didn't take one and you should have taken it before the pandemic started. Um, those are not going to be questions. So I think if you have a step two score, because whatever the scheduling situation for you was and you took the exam, great. If you don't have one, it's not hurting you to not have one. Very good. Dr. Crusher, over anything to add about step two in this application process? I was going to say back to, I agree with Dr. Mirza, same thing. I can't imagine that people are going to pay too much attention to it. But back to my first question about the uh, step one score, if you do have an, a lower step one score, then trying to get one of those step two dates to be able to include that in your application and show that the step, the prior step one score doesn't define you, I think would be of value. Very good. Dr. Rayblad, anything to add about step two and how you uh, evaluate candidates? I think if you have a step two, include it. If you don't, you can't include something you don't have. Um, as, as everyone said, if you have it and it's good, it, it helps you. If it's not there, it's not there. I, I, have a, I have a rising senior who's applying to colleges now, and we're kind of facing this whole SAT situation in the similar process and sitting at town halls, and I'm on your side, guys. 
experiencing this on the other side. So it's, um, you have what you have. Great, all right, let's move on to the next question. Debates have existed around the number of in-person sub-eyes medical students without home urology programs can perform. Previous answers had indicated they could do more than one. Are these medical students, and some have called them orphan medical students, if you will, however you like to term it, allowed to do multiple away rotations? Does that introduce inequity in favor of these students? Please clarify. We're gonna to go to Dr. Green with this question. Okay. So I know there's been a lot of anxiety about this and a lot of questions about this. So I'm gonna to try to clarify this as best as I can. If you have a home urology program, so not the people in this question, but if you have a home urology program, you are allowed to do as many sub-eyes at home as you want. There's no limit. You can do one, you have to do one, you can do more than one. So there's no limit to how many home urology sub-eyes you can do. And there's also no limit to how many virtual sub-eyes you can do. And that's if you have a urology program at your institution. If you're a student who does not have a urology program, and some people say orphan students, but now I'm speaking about them, you are allowed to do as many away rotations as you want. Keeping in mind, it's very, very difficult to schedule these away rotations. You have to schedule one that's required, just like home, people with a home urology program have to do one. So theoretically, are medical students without a home urology program allowed to do multiple away rotations? Yes, just like people who have a home program are allowed to do multiple home rotations. Um, people without a home program, these orphan students are also allowed to do multiple away rotations. I will just say one clarifying point. If you have a home program, that means you have mentorship at your fingertips. You have the ability to do research with these people. You can stop by, you can go to Grand Rounds, you can interact with, with residents. So you have a lot of advantages to having a home urology program that people without one, they don't have. And so in many years, not this year obviously, but in prior years, students with the home urology program would do one or two away sub eyes. Students who did not have a home urology program at all would do like three or four. So just to sort of help people understand what it's like, whether you have a home program or you don't have a home program. So that's gonna inform my answer to the last question. Is it unfair? Is, is there inequity in favor of students without a home urology program? I don't think so because they don't have the mentors that we just spent a lot of questions saying that you have to have. Um, these students are gonna have to travel to find a place that's gonna allow them to do a rotation. Their schools are going to have to allow them to do that as well. And this is difficult. Um, they're not going to have one-on-one -on -one mentorship. And so a lot of people could consider that if you don't have a home urology program, you have a slight disadvantage to start off with. In my mind, and from the SAU's perspective, giving students with a program, with a home program, the ability to do multiple at home, and giving students without a home program the ability to do multiple ways, that is that's parity, that's equity. So you're letting people still do the sub eyes that they can do. Um, so, you know, it, it does, it's not really introducing inequity. From my perspective, I welcome other opinions and I hope that clarifies it. Well, that was, that was a very comprehensive answer. Dr. Richstone, anything to add to that discussion? I think that was a comprehensive answer. I don't, listen, there are two different scenarios, right? They're never going to be, there's no way to make them identical, right? These folks are going to, they have different challenges. Um, it's difficult to say which set of challenges is harder to overcome. Do I think these, again, to use the term orphan candidates are, are have a leg up? I personally don't think so. I mean, I think it's difficult and it's a real challenge to not have a home program to have uh, mentors and residents around, that whole milieu of, of urology around you, it's a disadvantage, I think. And I, I don't think any potential to do away rotations, whether it's one, two, or three, I don't think uh, puts those folks in a, in a thrust forward into a pole position here or a superior position. I don't think so at all. So, you know, it's life. There's different set of circumstances. And I think when it all shakes out, you know, hopefully, I'm more concerned about the orphan students, so to speak, and, but I think it shakes out as well as it's gonna shake out. Dr. Mirza, anything to add? 
No, I'm, uh, and, uh, I think Dr. Green, Dr. Ray Stones have covered it. I, I don't have anything to add. I do personally believe that the students who don't have a home program are at a huge, huge disadvantage and no amount of rotations that they do, as Dr. Ritson already stated, will make up for the advantage you have when you have a home program. It's uh, it's, it's not comparable. So um, don't feel bad that they get to do more than one away rotation. Um, it's okay, you're fine. Great. And you know, obviously this this was an interesting question that came up a couple of times. So I wanna open it up for any of the others, Dr. Kresh over about a lot of Ray Blatt, anything to add to this? Otherwise we've gotten some really great comprehensive answers. We'll move on. Okay, why don't we get the next slide? So this um, this is a very specific question that should be a quick answer, I think. And so so for students without a home urology program, do they have to rotate at quote unquote the closest accredited program by mileage or just in the region? And I think we kind of got this answer already, but I'll go back to Dr. Green. Anything to clarify on this at all? Yeah, so to clarify, it's just in the region. Um, it's I, I know our, our statement by the SAUs caused a lot of people some anxiety about this as well. We're gonna modify it. So it is not the closest program by mileage. It is in the region. You should take into account your um, mentor's advice on this. If they are recommending you go to one versus another, that is sufficient. You know, the whole the whole point behind trying to get people not to do away sub eyes, traveling on a plane, going to other cities, uh, spreading COVID, getting sick, being far from home if you do get sick. So we want we just wanted people to be able to travel by car in a region, but obviously take into account your mentor's advice, your school's advice. Um, no one's gonna be measuring mileage. We want you to do what's the best for you and for your education. Great, I think I think we'll move on. I think we got the answer to that. Yeah, and remember that many institutions are not allowing outside sub ice too. So that's gonna restrict and limit a lot of orphan students and finding places where they can rotate. Dr. Rayblatt, once again, you're a mind reader because our next question is asking, is there a deadline for programs to decide on offering virtual sub eyes? And have you heard of programs offering extended sub eyes at home institutions up to eight weeks? Is this reasonable? And so that goes back to your point. Well, maybe you can't even host a virtual sub eye at your institution. Is there, are you aware of any deadlines or what is what have you learned through your institution as far as instituting a virtual sub eye? For my, my institution does not have any deadlines or restrictions. We as a program, we got together with the faculty and my program director, we decided not to offer a virtual sub I, but offer interested students other way to participate in our grand rounds, in our indication conference, in uh, connection with residents. Very and uh, home institute extended sub I's at a home institution, um, as I said earlier, I feel this is a time to learn more about medicine. And because the year put you in the position that you cannot go to other institutions for sub I, I don't think you can do a lot more in eight weeks that you haven't done in four weeks if your ma uh, main goal for sub I is to get to know the program, show yourself to the program, and build a relationship. I think this, again, this is a time that can be better used in uh, learning more of medicine. But that, that's maybe it's my opinion. I don't know what uh, other people feel like. Dr. Also, Badalotta. if you don't get along with your program on the sub I, then you're stuck with them for eight weeks, and they're stuck with you for eight weeks. Just as a thought. What would you add from the Columbia experience that you uh, that you've seen, Dr. Batalato? Was, was there deadlines or hard stops to get these virtual sub I's off the ground? And what about someone being there for eight weeks on a sub I? Yeah, these are, I think that the, these are very institution specific in terms of the ability to offer a virtual sub I and what requirements are needed for the virtual sub I. Um, in our case at Columbia, we had to put, put a petition through an elective subcommittee to review that. Um, so the process varies. Um, and then as far as extended sub I's, again, that's standard, standard sub I is about four weeks. Um, at Columbia, we've offered a quote unquote extended sub I for sub I's who had their experience in March interrupted with the shutdown, which occurred after March 13th. The medical school shut down and pulled students. Um, students were gradually pulled from clinical rotation. So they're going to have the opportunity to. Um, you know, repeat their time. But again, these are these are individual questions for your department and your medical school. Um, the timelines are not standard and the course offerings are not standard. Dr. Crashover, anything to add? I think that um, in a way the programs have a disadvantage this year in that 
the virtual sub eyes, all of us are very excited about the opportunity, but it does require a lot of bandwidth in addition to trying to make up from um, some of the COVID time. And so I know at our institution, we're still trying to work out the logistics of, of how to be able to accomplish some of these higher goals of involving people in the OR and things like that. To, to Gina's point about, you know, having to go through the universities to get approval for these things. So it may be a little bit slower. I don't think that there is a deadline and it doesn't mean, I think a lot of programs don't necessarily have the bandwidth to be able to offer it um, even when we all want to. Great. I'm going to move on unless there's anything anyone else would like to add to this discussion. Okay. Seth, can I say one thing along those sure. lines? So I think for students, one value in the path of doing the home sub-I and the way sub-I was sort of solidifying your decision to do urology. And so if you're still kind of deciding and you're not sure and you do your one home sub-I, and there's still some questions in your mind, I can imagine that would be a situation where rather than doing an extended eight week sub eye, maybe you do another one at home, like peds versus adult or onc, or if you're at a program that has multiple sites, um, you could maybe consider that if it's you know a decision-making opportunity. So that might be when a student may consider doing another sub eye at home rather than extended, but a different type. Very good. It's a very good point. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, this goes back to interview. Now we're talking about interviews. So, will programs offer more interviews than they can conduct? Than they can conduct? Will there be restrictions to students declining previously accepted interviews? And are there concerns that a small percentage of students may hold most of the initial interview invites? Okay, so so why why don't we why don't we go to Dr. Richstone for this uh, particular set of questions? Then we'll have a few people answer. Okay, will programs offer more interviews than they conduct? No, they should not do that. They should, it's not like inviting uh, folks to a wedding where you uh, plan on a certain people not attending. So they should offer the amount of interviews that they can offer and that they can actually fulfill. Will there be restrictions to students declining previously accepted interviews? Um, not to my knowledge. I don't think there's any way we can police that. Um, mm. So I'm not aware of any restrictions on students declining previously accepted interviews, although it's not good form. Um, it's uh, not very nice to your, your peers and other students because um, you'll be boxing them out and they may have missed an opportunity to get an interview. Are there concerns that a small percentage of students may hold most of the initial interview invites? Um, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think so. I, Mobin, Kirsten, you guys have been involved with us a, a lot on the SAU side. Do you have any sense of that last one? I Dr. Think, Merzer, Dr. Green. Yeah, so in terms of a, a small percentage of students holding most of the initial interview invites, I don't think it's going to be, so I think it's going to be less this year than past years, but I think that same problem happens every year. There's a certain number of applicants, and if they apply broadly enough, they get a lot of interviews. And in past years, you wouldn't know when you were getting the interview because it was a rolling process. So people would end up kind of accruing a ton of interviews, holding the spots, holding the spots, not letting other people get that spots, and then canceling them as they found out, as they found more desirable interviews. My thought um, is that this year, with the way we're doing it, that small percentage of students are not going to hold most of the initial interviews because you get all of your interview invitations as a batch. And so you have to choose. You can't just keep them all and say yes to everything. You have to pick which ones you're going to attend and which ones you're going to cancel. So it should work the opposite this year. There should be fewer, um, there should be more invitations available for students who aren't that small percent. And to push back on that, though, Kirsten, a little bit, just to be devil's advocate, with their ability to do more interviews because they're not restricting their tra you know, their travel restrictions aren't there, the budgetary restrictions aren't there. It's, even, it's much easier to do more interviews because you don't have to travel. So Unless those there's folks, a direct those time folks, overlap, people will take all the interviews, right? Yeah, well, if, if, it's a if day there's overlap. a time interview that uh, overlap, then yeah, you can't do more than one interview on a day. So yeah. there'll be certain inherent limitations but right. I'm, you know these are our challenges and just like you said 
Dr. Green, they've always been challenges and they will continue to be. It's hard to say if they'll be worse this year or not. Yeah. Let's move on to the, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Crusher. Yeah, yes. I do want to ask students as you accept interviews and then you change your mind, try to do it as early as possible. As we sit on this side, the cancellations at two days before the interview puts us and also your colleagues at a lot of disadvantage because fill this opened up spots is really challenging. A little bit easier this year because you just have to zoom in. In the past, getting someone to last minute travel was really challenging. And you always have, you probably know, always have last minute dropouts. Uh, yeah, Seth, can I do, uh, sorry, go ahead, Jessica. No, we'll go to, we'll go to, we'll go to okay. Crushover and then Mirza, Dr. Crushover. There are lots of data that show that basically the number of interviews haven't changed over the years, despite the fact that there's a huge uptick in how many places people are applying to. So it, there's, there's very little point to apply to a million programs that you don't have interest in going to. And it's to your own benefit not to do that, especially to your colleagues' benefit not to do that. And these are the people that you're going to spend your careers with. And so I think for everyone to like know that and understand that and really apply to and accept interviews to the places that they're truly interested in would be to everyone's advantage because programs, the best thing we could do for applicants is to take every applicant at face value that they want to come so that we look at their application in its entirety and you know give it great thought as opposed to everyone applying everywhere where then you become more reliant on trying to sift through and find menial ways to to distinguish between students so it's to everyone's advantage just apply and just interview to the places they're interested in dr mirza i just want to address that uh, second question which is restrictions to declining previously accepted interviews there are no restrictions uh, I do want to point out that the Society of Academic Urologists has spent a great deal of time um, trying to convince ourselves uh, and making a path where we have a uh, concerted effort to offer you interviews and then you, for you to accept your interviews to make it easy for the medical students who are applying so you're not getting out of your shower, checking your phone, taking a bite of your food and then checking your phone again to see if you got an interview offer. So the point is, if you get an interview offer on that first round, when everybody's offering you interviews, and then you accept an interview, having a whole weekend to think about it, and then two days later you decline that interview, that's problematic. Uh, I think that would look very poorly upon you. It's more than just poor form. Um, in the past, what I have done, if somebody declines an interview or cancels an interview last minute, I email that student's program director to say, your student screwed me. Um, and this year, I think um, it's going to be a bigger issue uh, because if you accepted it after having a good weekend to think about it, and then you decline it later, that's really poor form. And I'm going to send five emails out instead of one. We all want to be Remind me to never. We're going to help Dr. Mirza find you on Twitter, and we're going to take care of you. No, 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 no. it's a very valid point. It's a very valid point. Yeah, I think I think the main point is that urology is a small community. Um, we're a small subspecialty, and we all interact with one another. And so, what may seem like a small decision may, you know, may have a larger ripple effect as we communicate with one another and. Um, you know, go through this novel year and this new, you know, interview cycle. Very good. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So I, so a couple of announcements. We're getting close to six slash nine p.m. No worries. I see no questions from our webinar attendees, and I have many questions to go. So we're we are good. Um, let's see. How will the waitlist for interviews following the initial invite we can be handled? Let's go back to Dr. Green. Um, any clarification for how waitlist for interviews will be handled? Yeah, it's going to be the same way it's been in the past. That's not going to be changed at all. So each program is going to have a waitlisted list of applicants. And so kind of like what Dr. Mirza was just saying, you know, on Monday, we're going to get all of our RSVPs. We're going to know how many spots we have open. And then, you know, if I have five spots left, then I go down one, two, three, four, five on my waitlist, offer to them, see if they accept. Very good. That seems fairly straightforward. I have a yeah. question for Dr. Green. 
when you when we release let's say the next five applic uh, invitations how much time that second wave has to respond to us that so this year that what that part's not timed next year if people like this kind of synchronized wave then we'll time next year as well um but it's up to you it's up to your program okay so but we can on our emails offer you an interview and say we'd like a response from you in whatever three days yeah. And if you we don't hear from you, that spot goes to the next person on the way. I think that's a great way to do it. Or even say, I need a response in 24 hours or else we'll go to our next applicant. Yeah, just so people can make plans and, and we can go on down the list. It's a really good idea. Perfect. Thank you. Very good. OK, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this goes back to interviews, and I'm not sure if we even have this um, formalized yet uh, through SAU, but will there be a standardized format to virtual interviews? Any of the um, SAU team members involved with this decision, or is, is there or is there not? There, no. there is not. There is not. We are, you know, the SAU is uh, putting some time towards this. Uh, Pruthi at San Francisco is uh, leading a, a group to think about this, to put out, you know, best practices to help guide programs. Because right now programs are all going to have to come up, uh, you know, with their own concepts for this. And so the SAU, uh, as a leadership organization, and also to to uh, ease the process both for programs and candidates alike, they're going to put out best practices and share share thoughts on the matter. But at the end of the day, it will be program uh, specific, and programs will set it up the way they see fit. Very good. Anything to add? Otherwise, we'll move on. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. Okay, um, is there a more consistent platform that can be used to disseminate standardized information for program open houses and available virtual sub eyes? Perhaps the SAU website could be used for such. Um, what do you guys think? Is there could we do better on this? Is there is there is there a, a better main? And I will say this, it's amazing, and we're going to touch on this later on, briefly towards the end of this. There are some burgeoning social media websites. That have taken this task over and they seem to be doing a very very good job of it um, and we'll mention them but for now from the team members here panelists do you, is there anything on the horizon regarding formalizing this into a particular website or not so much these are on the sau website yeah the, apparently we're not the, doing a very good job of it. That's, that's that's the criticism but yeah they're yeah. on there <laughs> i think if if you look at the SAE website, it's pretty paltry as of now, and there's a lot yeah. of data um, or, or invites coming out, and it seems like um, those that probably isn't real time being updated as much as it, it could be, um, yeah. unless anyone has anything to add to that. I think um, this year it's really important um, to get on to to be you know looking at websites, even being on social media. A lot of data has shown that urologists use Twitter as the main form. A, you know, popular form of communication. Um, so a lot of it's on social media. Um, but even historically, for sub for sub internships, not all programs participated in VSAS, the universal application for visiting rotation. So, um, you know, it's 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 informative to take a look at you know and department websites and um, look at other uh, social media outlets uh, through Twitter and also the organizations rural residency is one that organized by students that are putting together you know and continuously updating a list of available rotations open houses and things like that can I just to be very clear about this um, if you go to the Society of Academic Urology webpage and there's a drop that one of the tabs on top says match. You drop down and there's a link that says open house and interview dates. And you click on that and it clearly delineates the open houses. And there's another sub tab that says virtual sub internships. And you look at that and they're, they're clearly listed one by one, the institution, the dates and times, uh, how to register. So it's there. Uh, uh, and obviously we can do better at popularizing it, but it's all on the website. So hopefully Very this good. will help get that word out. This is the here you, you heard it here. To popularize it more to the programs to have it updated because it looks like it's the Twitter is a little bit more updated than this, but it's on programs. It's not on SAU to go and look when we're offering the, the townhouses. So but yeah. I think I think the best thing for students might be if they just follow all the programs they're interested in on Twitter, then you're absolutely gonna see when there's an that open is. house, when there's a virtual sub eye. So that probably is a better real-time way to I do think this so. from a student's perspective. 
Very good. Let's move on to the next slide. The programs host open houses on the weekends or record and post. Inherent challenges exist with needing to be on clinical rotations and not in front of the computer, hindering attendance. Dr. Kreshover, what do you think about the challenges of attendance trying to get to programs they're really interested in for these open houses if they're not on the weekend? I, when I read this, I thought it was a really good, it's a really clever suggestion. I kind of don't have a good reason for why I didn't think of that beforehand. Um, the recording, um, at least in uh, for our institution, we uh, with the virtual open houses, we have a session with the residents afterwards. So, I mean, I think as part of a way to keep people's discussions that feels more intimate um i that was not that's not recorded and i don't know uh to kind of keep that authenticity to it whether or not it would be a good idea to but certainly the beginning part with intros etc i think that's reasonable also very good dr rayblatt what would you add to this it's interesting so my thought was to host them on the weekends and my program director said that he didn't want to barge into medical students weekend time that everybody's so busy and so stressed out that he preferred to do it and we went with it because he really didn't want to get into your guys's weekend time but if weekends are better we can do it on weekends we can alternate great yeah, I, yeah. keep in mind that many of the open houses up to this point were at a time when things were clinically slower because of the pandemic and now people are emerging from that and you know volume is increasing so that might drive innately drive more of the open houses to occur on the weekend if you know if not during later hours during the weekdays true yeah, very good we'll move on unless anyone has anything else to add okay next slide Okay, are programs taking directed moves to limit implicit bias? Dr. Mirza, what do you think about this question? Yeah, this is a really nice and loaded question. Um, <laughs> I think you will need to come visit me at uh, Kansas City and I can have a good session with you about implicit bias. The simple answer is I don't know what other programs are doing. Um, I can speak for my own program and uh, to my medical school. Um, that there is a lot of traction around uh, racism, specifically racism against uh, black Americans, um, and also um, the Black Lives Matter movement, attention being called to police brutality. Um, I serve on the Dean's Inclusion and Diversity Cabinet, um, so we are doing a lot of sessions um, to train uh, individual departments, residents, um, and residents get this training, I think, as part of their GME curriculum anyway, um, and we're, we have doubled our efforts to do that. We did, just did a session with our residents on Monday, um, including the medical students that were on the rotation. Um, so yes, uh, I think uh, we are getting trained in implicit bias, which hopefully means that we will be limiting some bias that we have inherently in all of us. Um, I think this takes a lot of introspection. This takes uh, a cultural change for many people and within themselves and then for their programs. Um, so I think the simple answer is yes, most medical schools are on top of this um, and uh, they're at least uh, doing their best to educate uh, their campuses, their student bodies, their faculty, um, and also making uh, dialogue um, for activism. So I think the answer is yes. Very good, okay. Dr. Rayblad, anything to add to this discussion about uh, implicit bias during the application process? So I read this question a little differently. I thought the students are asking, what are we doing to limit implicit bias specifically as we review applications and select people for uh, to offer interviews? So I'm going to answer it from this perspective. And uh, what we have is we have applications reviewed by two or sometimes three, depending on the volume of interview of independent reviewers. So everyone on faculty interviews and we pair our uh, reviewers, not we pair our reviewers uh, to make the pair as diverse as possible, giving what our faculty allows. Um, so that's what we try, uh, how we try to limit the implicit bias and uh selection uh, of offering the interviews we i think inherently as dr Merza said we have our own biases people tend to like people who are like them one way or the other so to limit it that's 
what we do. And then our program director re-reviews the application. So in terms of work done specifically in the program, I think that's a question to individual program. And as you attend the town halls, I think that's a very good question to ask uh, individual programs. We all do, we all have a lot of work to do. Dr. Badalato, yeah. and then Dr. Richstone. I agree with everything that's been said. This is something that is um, really a pressing issue um, now more than ever. Um, and I think that uh, having, at least in terms of applicant review, just having a committee and several people looking at the applications holistically um, from multiple viewpoints um, is important. And then just keeping in mind that diversity is a goal in and of itself. And we, we want to recruit a heterogeneous group of residents and who are going to become, you know, future urologists that um, can connect with all the patient populations that they that they treat. And so, diversity in and of itself is a goal um, that we're looking that we're looking at when we we assess these applications. Very good, very good, Dr. Richstone. Yeah, I was going to say just as a, again a plug. Uh, to the virtual sub I program. We developed a curriculum and uh, I see Dr. Kurt, Dr. Green's laughing because I always seem to come back to the virtual sub internships. <laughs> but, uh, but it is germane to this conversation because we did develop a curriculum where there's some attention to the uh, uh, professionalism and interpersonal and communication skills, uh, um, ACGME uh, 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 competencies. And in that competency, we have sessions uh, available specifically on implicit bias. And I think just the mere fact that uh, the SAU's effort here included um, that, that topic speaks volumes. And it's another avenue by which we're trying to address it. And it's also a great opportunity for anyone who uh, feels like that is impacting their professional career or wants to, you know, have a frank discussion about it with a program and their and their faculty and whatnot. I think it's a really unique and, and excellent opportunity to do so. But again, it's an example of tackling this head on, uh, and the SAU is very cognizant of this and is uh, trying to uh, take positive action. Anything else to add from the panelists? Otherwise, we'll move on. I was going to say, I, I, to Dr. Raybot's point, I think it is a wonderful thing, an opportunity for students to ask about. And I think that, you know, one of the things we made an effort to do in interviews was change from kind of the how you do in, how, you know, where do we connect to now being formalized questions that every, every applicant, every interviewee gets um, that's also judged by a panel where it's more situational and not just about, you know, personality and what you click with. And so I think that it's important to look for those qualities in the programs as you go through to know that they're making more of an effort to meet um, the interests of all. Very good. Okay. Next slide. Okay, this is our last set of prepared questions. I actually now have a lot of questions from the webinar attendees. Go figure. Um, so but let's answer this and then we'll keep moving. So will international medical international medical graduates be able to participate in virtual sub eyes? Are there any factors unique to this year's match for IMG applicants? How can an IMG be competitive this year? Um, Dr. Green, any input for this particular set of questions? I think whether or not IMGs are going to be able to participate in virtual sub eyes, I don't see a reason why not, but there will be institutional rules about this, whether um, IMGs are eligible or not. So that might be something that's handled on a school to school basis. I think in terms of factors unique to this year, I think it's difficult because in the past, a lot of international medical graduates would come and do away sub eyes to get exposure. And so obviously this year is very challenging in that regard, especially with international travel restrictions if someone is going to school outside of the United States um, versus people who are inside. And then in terms of how can you be competitive, I think it's no different from anything that we've mentioned. If you're able to do a virtual sub I do it. If you have mentors, have them reach out, um, you know, use your connections, email, express interest. This year, expressing interest is gonna be a really big deal. And every single person on this uh, webinar tonight she sort of mentioned how important it is for our programs to know that you really are interested because, you know, as, as students, I'm sure you're very worried and are going to think about applying to a lot of programs. We're recommending not applying to more than 50. 
Um, but as from a program perspective and a program director perspective, we're really worried, you know, what if what if students really aren't that interested in our program and how are we going to know? So a genuine expression of interest uh, goes a long way. And I think that's a way an international medical graduate can be competitive as well. Unless there's anything, anything to add, otherwise we'll move on to some of the, uh, the written, the add on questions. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so these are coming directly from our webinar attendees. I'll read it and then we'll ask it to the panelists. What advice do you have for students who have a strong interest in urology, but for whatever reason do not get along or fit well with their home program? Interesting situation. Mm. Interesting situation. Dr. Green, let's go right back to you, Dr. Green. What do you think about this? They, they <laughs> want to go. It, well, ask Dr. Richstone. She has an answer for it. Let's get another Dr. answer. Dr. Richstone's going to say do a virtual semi. Virtual semi. <laughs> 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 no, I, I think that's, that is a, that's certainly a challenging situation because your mentors are going to be the people in your home department and you're going to have to rely on them to some degree for advice, for guidance. Um, they're going to have to write you letters. So whether you fit in with your home program or not, um, you don't have to fit in with your home program. You just need their mentorship and their support. You need letters of recommendation and you need somebody to look over your list and give you advice. And that is our job as educators and it's our job as program directors and chairs to support you whether we think you're going to be a fit for our own program or somewhere else. So I wouldn't make too much of whether you feel like you're a fit. Keep in, keep in mind what you're after is mentorship, support, and guidance. And Very look good. for external mentors as well, if you can. You know, if you really feel like you don't have a home mentor, look for an external mentor. Very good. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, um, it's not just so you think about not just your de, you know department as a whole but also think about all the faculty in the department and also ask the question why don't you mesh with your department or with with a particular person in a leadership role in the department is it a personality issue is it is it something else um and perhaps there's another faculty member that has a different perspective and that you can go to for mentorship and support or that you can work with in a research project and therefore you know gain advice but i think that you should look closely at all the faculty in the department and there should be you know really try to find somebody that you feel understands you and who's kind of can address the main issue as to why why you feel that you don't mesh well very good. Let's I can imagine some reasons, though, why a student wouldn't necessarily fit in. If it's a very homogeneous department and a student happens to be different um, in gender, in race, I can imagine a situation where maybe somebody would feel like they don't fit in well or that they feel uncomfortable. So I would reiterate again, if there's a way to find an external mentor, whether it be a virtual semi um, or just reaching out to someone else, I think that's a, a good way to get external support as well. Don't be shy about that. Very good. These, you guys are all doing such a fantastic job answering these questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to answer, ask, uh, tell you a few more questions. Maybe try to be brief in the answers because we're going to try to get to three to five more before we have to start signing off here. So here we go. This is the next question. How early in the process should we have program directors reach out to your programs on our behalf to let you know that we are interested? Was there a timeline for that, Dr. Rayblatt? I think you can start tomorrow. There you go. You wanted a brief answer. That's good. Dr. Mirza, when, when should they call you and let them know they want to come to your program? Yeah, anytime. Very good. I, I agree with Dr. Rayblad. Okay. This is going back to another orphan applicant question. The updated guidelines are still planning to include, and this is in quotes, at the closest ACGME accredited program possible. So if, you, if, if they want to do multiple aways or sub eyes, do they still have to stay in a close region or can they do those a little further away? Do the, all the programs have to be in a close region for the, for the students who had a home program? Dr. Green or Dr. Richstone, Dr. Mirza? They should be within that region. Yeah, you want to stay, the idea is to stay regional. Got it, okay. Uh, the, uh, when it comes to, IMGs, okay, um, it, you know, is there a unique 
interest in their steps two scores as an IMG? Would an IMG do themselves well by going after a step two and trying to get that on their application? I think the only step one. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Probably not, probably not much different, right? Yeah. I think everyone would say. The only uh, uh, unique aspect for the step two is the clinical portion. And sometimes for uh, applicants who are foreign grads, just being able to demonstrate that they were able to pass the clinical portion based on cultural interaction with a patient, fluency in English language, so on. I think those things are helpful to see in a step two, but I agree with the panel. I don't think it's necessary, um, just like other applicants, but sometimes it is helpful to have the CK portion demonstrated to be passed. And that may be very limited in the setting that we're in right now. This is a question I think we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Was someone going to say something? I was just going to say, most of the time you can demonstrate that through the personal statement. So, you know, even without it, and I know step two is a hot mess right now. So. And I'm uh, so I'm going to ask a question here. I think we kind of know the answer, but let's make sure it's explicitly said. Is there a cap on the number of programs students can apply to? Yes or no? No. No. <laughs> No. There is no cap. Be a good citizen. But be reasonable, people. Yeah. Please. 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 We or advise we'll find, 50. Please. <laughs> There's no cap. Or we'll find you on Twitter. No, no, that's fine. Okay, so so the, okay. Uh, Dr. Bruce will be after you. Yeah. Right, he's he's, well, he's going to get you. <laughs> How might students navigate expressing interest without running into the quote unquote eros illegality or NRMP police? How do they how do they communicate their interest and communicate with you without going beyond the guidelines of of what they're being told? So Stay remember the, the guidelines. guidelines the communication guidelines apply after the interview, not before. And Very it's good. a it's we're not allowed the programs are not allowed to communicate with the applicants. Right. The applicants can send me as many emails as they want. I'm not allowed to reply, but you're not going to violate. Can I the clarify, Dr. Button. Green? Are you not allowed to reply after interview or you're not to reply, allowed to reply now? After interview. Okay. I just yeah. want to make yeah. it clear for us, for after audience. The interview. After okay. the interview, before the match, you're not, you, Dr. Rayblatt, are not allowed to reply. Yeah. Before, yeah. you can. That's what the, all students should know is that really that those restrictions apply to us, not you. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, this is another question. I think I, I know the answer to this, but let's see what you what you all have to say. Will there be any effort to coordinate dates of interviews so that all of the programs in one city are not on the same day? No. Unless it's on sort of their own goodwill. Yeah. Very so good. So some regions will kind of group interviews, but we are not, uh, the SAU is not organizing that this year. Got it. As far, um, okay, let's go to another question here. Let me see, we answered that one already. PDs, orphan applicants. Let's see here. Guys, if there's any other questions, start submitting, submitting them because we're basically, we're almost done here. Um, okay, very good. I think we're starting to reach, we've answered a lot of these. Some of these are repeats and I hope we've answered all your questions if we haven't necessarily hit on them. Um, Okay, what's this one? My learning uh, is rotation on the edge. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we start wrapping things up then? Let's go to the next slide, Jody. Okay. So there's a burgeoning social media urology presence, and and just to say, these are not AUA sources. I mean, this is not something we're professionally saying this is AUA you should go to. These are actually, you know, various um, independent sources, including the SAU. So. Uh, social media and Twitter is is amazing for urology. I mean, there's so many resources to access on there at Euroacademic, the SAU website, at Euro Residency is a fantastic Twitter handle and website that's come about now. And they're actually gonna be having some uh, roundtable discussions, I think, with other faculty in the future. And I think they've done a pretty good job populating their list of virtual sub-buys that are available. So you might wanna check that out. Urology list, Stream Team, EuroRes, EuroStream, EuroEd Central, which has a lot of the lectures, COVID lectures, the Empire Series lectures on there. Um, you know, the urology residency list on Twitter, which is managed by uh, Dr. Terrace. Um, and then Eurosomi. I mean, this is just, and this isn't comprehensive. This is me looking at social media saying, hey, there's some really excellent resources on there. Um, what about our panelists? Am I anything to add to this or anything I'm missing about using social media to interact with you and with urology in general? 
I think you got it. All right, very I good. I actually took a picture of your slide to share it with my social <laughs> so, media team. So did I. Ah, perfect. Very good. We like to serve. Okay, next slide. All right. Of course, I have to promote the AUA Medical Student Education website, which is what I'm a part of. Um, really great website with uh, some fantastic videos, specifically when it comes to GU physical exam for both men and women. One of the most utilized resources on the AUA, AUA website are these videos about GU exams. We have some really fantastic recorded medical student webinars. If you liked what you saw tonight, we've got a few more. And it goes all the way back to two or three years ago and would encourage you to look on there. There's some really helpful information. We also, we also recently posted some really great common videos or, or some videos of common procedures like suprapubic tube placement, prostomy tube placement. These are things that you might want to watch to get familiar with before you're engaged in a sub eye experience. Next slide. AUA medical student membership is free. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's free. And so if you're not a member, you should be a member. Okay, lots of resources, free educational resources like the AUA core curriculum, access to online publications, and you get resources to prepare for residency. Next slide, please. We'd love for you to follow the American Neurologic Association on Twitter. There's hashtags commonly used in urology, and I just put a few of those on there. AUA match, Euromatch, Eurores, Med Student Urology, Med Twitter. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Weiner, who's one of our committee members, has done a fantastic job essentially live tweeting our entire discussion tonight. So feel, feel free to go on Twitter and see the pearls of wisdom that we've documented there for you. Excellent job, sir, thank you. Next slide. <laughs> Most importantly, I have to thank this superb group of urologists who I'm honored to be associated with. Dr. Green, Dr. Richstone, Dr. Mirza, Dr. Kreshover, Dr. Badalato, Dr. Rayblatt. We thank you so much for your input. I think the quality of these people and their genuine caring about how you do as applicants speaks to urology as a whole. We're fortunate to be in this subspecialty. Uh, um, such fantastic people. I think with that, we're going to call it an adjournment this evening. This will Wait be one minute. Yes, please go ahead. Please. <laughs> we, would be, we would be remiss if we didn't thank Dr. Seth thank Cohen. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Seth, you thank you have a silky you, smooth Seth. delivery. You <laughs> you handled this with aplomb. You you should be a game show host. I think that you might be next in line uh, to take over Alex for that. Yeah, I listen. If this whole urology thing doesn't work out, you never know. So very we'll smooth. <laughs> Yeah, beautifully we got done. radio radio voice ready beautifully yeah. done well that's you know i hide my <laughs> face and i work with the voice that's what i do so there, there you go there the man go. behind the curtain that's right well the good news hey, is, is and oh, my pleasure my pleasure this has been recorded for all the webinar attendees so that it will be posted onto the aua medical student website feel free to share it with your friends the whole purpose here was to give you information we hope we have done that we wish you nothing but fantastic things this is a crazy horrible world with horrible things around us so sorry about all the bad things that have gone on but look to what you have to look forward to this is a fantastic specialty we take a happiness and pride in you joining us in the future and we wish you a very fond farewell and good night thank you very much Yay. Thank you.